Thanks very much. Is, can you hear me? Is that working? Yeah. Thanks very much indeed, Eric. Thanks for the organizers. This is a fabulous conference, a very friendly looking audience, lots of friends, uh, which is really good. Uh, so this is my title, Come Find Me If You Want a Rodent Electrophysiology Job. Uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, abstraction and inference in the hippocampal frontal circuit. And uh, my group uh, works on these kinds of problems. Uh, so how do you represent, learn about, make decisions uh, in these complex worlds? Uh, and recently, we've been thinking predominantly about how you represent these uh, links. And we've taken a lot of inspiration from the world of spatial cognition. And so uh, if you're this rat wandering around the world taking a tortuous part and you happen upon some cheese, then the next time you want some cheese, you have uh, different options of what you might do. <coughs> you could either um, repeat those actions exactly to go and pick up the cheese, or, if you know something about, the, uh, the, about how relationships work, the structure of relationships in two-dimensional space, then you can make an inference that this angle would be uh, the correct uh, way to go. And in the 1940s, uh, people like Tolman uh, were interested in these kinds of inferences, and uh, Tolman, uh, th uh, the ability to make them led Tolman to believe in something called a cognitive map. <coughs> And now we um, uh, know something about the neuronal basis of this cognitive map, and so there are these very famous uh, cells that won the uh, 2014 Nobel Prize, place cells and grid cells. But along with those uh, come a whole... Sorry, I just start my clock a bit two minutes late. Um, <laughs> along with those uh, come a whole zoo of other uh, spells, uh, cells that are equally uh, space, that e spatially specific and seem to play bespoke roles in the spatial mapping problem. <coughs> I'm just showing you a few of them here. There are many, many. And the other thing that's interesting to note and exciting, I think, is that um, it's not just the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus that has these kinds of cells in humans. Um, so in humans, uh, they've also been found in cortex, uh, uh, initially by Christian Doerr, who's sitting over there, um, but also Josh Jacobs found them electrophysiologically. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, so, uh, these types of cells are involved in making spatial inf inferences that, you, that involve the structure of space. But we know that there are other relational or structural inferences that can be made around the uh, in and around the hippocampus. So, th so here's uh, Howard Eichenbaum, whose career was about relational memory, looking, and he invented and tested loads of things like this. But one of them was called transitive inference, so here's an example. Uh, so in transitive inference, he would say that um, he would give a rat a choice between two options, A and B, and the rat would be rewarded for choosing A. And then he would give them another option between B and C, and the rat would be uh, rewarded for, for choosing B. And then he would say, okay, so maybe the rat thinks A is better than B, and B is, big bigger than, is better than C, and maybe they've put them on some kind of relational line. And so if I gave them a probe test of A against C, then they should be able to get that right. And so that's called transitive inference, using the transitive structure of, uh, the, uh, of a, a linear structure of, of um, how uh, greater than or less than works to make inferences. And you could do something similar in, in, in social worlds, for example. So if you went down to the uh, gym and saw Jane beating up Bob and Bob beating up Alice, it, you would probably be able to um, uh, guess that Jane could beat up Alice in a boxing match. And we know uh, something that those systems are hippocampal, dependent. So, for example, uh, these, uh, you can see this in fMRI evidence. One example here is from Darth Kumaran, and he finds hippocampal and actually medial frontal activity uh, in these kinds of systems. Uh, but, that, but, but, uh, but also, uh, you can show it by making lesions. And this is a lovely demonstration by Howard, where he shows that if you remove either the um, fornix, which removes the uh, frontal inputs to the hippocampus, or the entorhinal cortex, which, reduced, which, redu which removes much of the input to the hippocampus, all of the sensory input, uh, then, uh, then rodents can still make those, pair, those decisions that you told them about, the A-B decisions, but they can't make the inferences. They won't choose A over C, even though A has been rewarded many more times than C. <coughs> okay. <coughs> 
And so th those kinds of uh, relational inferences, uh, there's, many, there's other types of them that involve hippocampus as well. Um, and uh, more recently, we and other people have been uh, uh, examining the possibility that those things might involve the same type of cell, um, cellular representations as space as well. And so here's some work from David Tank's lab uh, and Dmitry Aronov showing that uh, when animals have to represent uh, a linear structure in sound frequency, you can see place cells in those sound frequencies just like you would in space and something that might be grid cells if they were expanded into two dimensions. And then we've shown uh, that uh, some, the fMRI correlate of grid cells that we have is present in very in non-spatial uh, situations as well, very abstract situations like uh, like when you're trying to map out the length of the neck and the legs of some birds. <coughs> Okay, so that's roughly where we started, uh, where, I wanna, where I wanna start this, um, uh, this talk or this, um, this, this uh, project. Um, and it started with some, some puzzles. Um, and so the first is, how can this kind of relational inference work? Can the same system solve spatial and non-spatial problems? And, and why do the cells uh, look like they do? And the people puzzling about this uh, are James Whittington, who's up there in the audience I just spotted, um, and, uh, and Tim Muller. Uh, and James has done most of the modeling um, with a little bit of help, with, with help from Tim and not much from me. Okay. Uh, right, uh, so we're, we're we, in order to try to solve uh, these kinds of problems, um, we want to uh, start thinking about um, uh, how, what's the structure of the problem that the brain is solving. And so the, I'm just going to say there's two parts to this problem. Uh, the first part is this. If I tell you that Janice has a brother, Bob, and a child, Alice, then because you're clever humans, you can already tell me an awful lot of other things about this family. You can tell me all of these other things, these other relationships. Somehow you're doing path integration. You know which relationships add up to the same thing, like some kind of path integration, but in this abstract, non-spatial uh, gra graph. And the second property that we want uh, is, for you to be, is, is for you to be able to learn uh, these, uh, these uh, relational structures um, in one family and immediately, just in one shot, generalize them to some new family that you happen to meet one day. <coughs> and, so, and so those are the two properties we're going to try to make a system that we'll try and solve. And we're going to call it the tolman eichenbaum machine for reasons that should be obvious from my introduction. So here's the problem statement. Uh, given a, a stream of sensory stimuli and relations, um, <coughs> so for example, a light bulb, a right, broomstick, down, motorbike, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's got to predict what's going to come next. And that seems like an impossible challenge unless um, you can do something like this. If those things, if you know those things lie on some kind of relational map, and you've seen many of those relational maps before with a similar structure, and you can abstract the structure of those maps you've seen before. And then when you see this, these stimuli, you can place them down in the right place in these maps immediately in one shot and predict that you're going to see the light bulb next. So that's the kind of system uh, we're going to try and build. And that's obviously going to work in spatial situations like this, but also for any type of graph. <coughs> Okay, so you need some way of representing that abstract uh, relational structure. And you need some memory so that you know where, who is where in each individual family. So you can tie that in just one shot. So let's start with the memory because it's really easy. Um, <coughs> so uh, we just use a really typical uh, Hebbian memory that's often used uh, to model the hippocampus. And th these things work something like this. Uh, you take a sensory representation uh, of uh, so some, some activity and some simulated units, and you increase the weights between the ones that are firing. And then later, you can um, index uh, that, um, uh, uh, that uh, set of neurons with just a portion of those, um, of those, neuro uh, of those uh, that sensory representation. And because the weights are strong, it will pattern complete and it will return you the whole representation, right? But that isn't what we need. We need something a little bit different because we don't want to just pattern complete a sensory representation. We want to make a relational memory. We want to take some abstract uh, structural location and tie it 
to a sensory um, uh, to, a, to a sensory uh, event, so that you know that the motorbike is your uncle in this case. <coughs> okay, fine. Um, uh, right. So how do we do this? So uh, we know how to represent uh, this. This is that sensory stuff. That's the same as before. We don't, no idea how to represent this, but let's just imagine we knew how to represent that. That's going to be the challenge. But if we let's imagine we've solved this challenge, then we can just do the same thing we did and, put, um, uh, and build a Hebbian memory. But the, the, the critical thing is that the units in that Hebbian memory should only be active if they receive input from the correct abstract location and the correct sensory location. So they're like a conjunctive memory. And that's going to mean, so there's it's a conjunctive memory, because that means that if it receives one of them, it can, it can return the other. Right? OK, great. So this is uh, a slide explaining that. So if I've got this conjunctive memory, then I can retrieve what from where, like this. I can just uh, index it with the, with the uh, abstract location uh, and retrieve the sensory representation. Or I can retrieve where from what. I can index it with a sensory representation and re retrieve the abstract location. OK, so that's the memory solved. Easy. Well done, James. Um, and then, uh, so the, the next question is, how do I uh, represent this uh, location in this abstract space? And that seems like a real puzzle. <coughs> but it turns out that representing that, abs that understanding how to represent that, that um, uh, abstract uh, represent, make that, build that abstract representation is the same as understanding how to change it when you make a move in this map. I want to know how to change this representation as I move to my uncle or to my brother or to my father. So wh what I really want to do is, is to learn these weights. But that again seems like a difficult thing to do because uh, I've got two things that I don't know and I want to train some weights that, tr that, that change one into the other. I have no labels to do that training except that I have this uh, relational memory that I just told you about. And so this thing here actually can go and retrieve a concrete sensory thing. And so now I have something that I can train on, right? So I have this concrete sensory thing that I can uh, say, well, was, that, was it right? Was, was the chair my uncle? <laughs> and, um, and, the, uh, and if I'm right, then that's great. And if I'm wrong, I've got an error. And I can use that error via backpropagation uh, to train those weights. <coughs> it turns out if you're uh, Bayesian, uh, there are a bunch of other errors that you can use as well that are useful because these sensory events cascade up the system. So here's that sensory error. Um, but then you can use that sensory thing to infer some new play cells and see if they were the ones you predicted. And you can use those, those cells to infer some new uh, to, to infer some new abstract location and see if they were the ones you, you were predicted. So people who know Bayes, uh, this is a little bit like how a uh, Helmholtz machine works, with, uh, with um, each one of these generative model and an inference model training each other up, uh, just to, so the whole system learns to uh, predict the next sensory event. OK. So, what we, so just to remind you, what structural representation is important? What's important for that abstract structural representation? And the two important things are that it should make different representations at every vertex because it needs to index different memories at every vertex. And the second important thing is that it is whenever it comes back to the same place, it needs to, uh, it needs to make the same representation what, wherever it came from. Uh, because it needs to represent the correct, it needs to uh, index the correct memory. Okay. Right, that's the end of uh, a modeling section uh, before I show you some results, so you can all take a deep breath. Uh, here's a few take homes. Um, so, um, its job is to predict the next sensory observation. It learns to use this one shot rapid Hebbian memory. <coughs> it learns the relational structure of the world so it can address the correct memories. This relational structure is separated by the, by the uh, memories from the sensory input, which means it can generalize immediately to new worlds. And this memory is conjunctive. And so these are what the representations look like, uh, just to, just to uh, be clear about it. So the sensory and abstract representations are forced to be factorized, separated from each other. And then you combine them with these conjunctive representations in the, in the memories. <coughs> 
And I just wanted to compare that to what Howard Eichenbaum uh, used to say about the hippocampal formation, uh, which is that the inputs to the hippocampal formation, uh, are the, the lateral entorhinal cortex uh, has uh, sensory representations that are separated from the spatial representations. We're going to use structural, but he would say the spatial representations in the medial entorhinal cortex. And then in the hippocampus here, in the hippocampus, and then in the hippocampus here, uh, he, he, would, he, he would find these conjunctive cells, and he would call them conjunctive cells, uh, just like the conjunctive cells uh, in our memory. So this is like a rudimentary model of the hippocampal formation in, in terms of its computations. Okay, uh, so does it work? Uh, well, this is, the kind of, this is the way you're going to test uh, whether it works. What it's trying to do, remember, is guess all the relationships that it hasn't seen. It's trying to use inference to guess all the relationships that it hasn't seen. <coughs> and so if I show it this tortuous path through this graph, where it can see all the nodes, but only a very small portion of the relationships, then it should immediately guess all the other relationships. And so that means that, um, uh, <coughs> so that means uh, uh, its performance should increase as a function of the number of nodes it's seen, not as a function of the number of transitions it's seen, because it's sh it should be able to guess all of those. Okay, and so this is what, this is, uh, what it works. This is uh, performance in terms of guessing what's going to come next, um, as a f as a f and it goes up directly with the proportion of nodes it's visited, whereas something that had no structural knowledge would, you, would go up as a portion of the number of transitions it's seen. Uh, and that, um, just to show you that it's not just for space, this is a transitive inference graph uh, where, you where you can infer order on a line. Um, and here, uh, the first time we train, we train it, um, it's, uh, it's, it's rubbish at making inferences. Uh, but after just seeing 20 or so uh, transitive, inferen uh, transitive inference graphs, uh, it's, uh, it's really, it becomes really, really good at it, and it can, make the Im it can predict uh, things. Uh, it's it, can pr it, can pr it can predict um, uh, uh, transitions that it's never seen before almost every time. Okay, and similar thing for family trees. And when the graphs get more complicated, you need more training, uh, but a uh, similar thing works. Okay, uh, did we learn it? So, did, so, okay, we've got this rudimentary model of the hippocampus which seems to perform these kinds of re relational inferences. Um, <coughs> and so, what do the representations look like? Well, um, what we're going to do is start by letting the Tolman Eichenbaum machine just diffuse randomly in space on this graph. And if we do that, we, we get grid cells. We get grid cells um, uh, that uh, have different frequencies um, and that have uh, different phases within those frequencies. Um, and we also get things like band cells uh, that are often recorded in hippocampus. So uh, that's suggesting that these grid-like structures are really just Rep, uh, representing the basic 2D transition structure of space in a way that gives you the most, the, in, in a way that uh, encapsulates that 2D structure, but nevertheless makes an independent representation at each node. And that's um, exciting, but, uh, but shouldn't be a great surprise to people who were at the, um, at the, states, uh, at the um, states and Spaces workshop yesterday, because there are a number of other ways that you can show that kind of idea uh, in, um, more simply without building complicated neural networks. These ones, this one will generalize to lots of different sizes of, ne of network, but the basic principle that you're representing the 2D structure of space, for example, Kim Stackenfeld has shown that really nicely, and uh, Dory Durdickman, people like that. Okay, uh, so now let's look in the hippocampus. Um, well, these, hippocamp these hippocampal cells, remember, are conjunctions between those grid cells or those, those um, structural representations and sensory representations. And so they're going to be more focal than the grid cells because the sensory, the se the sensory representations are different at the different grid peaks. And so these things look like place cells. So um, uh, you can get small place cells uh, uh, because you've got small grid cells. And you can get big... Oh, and you can get big... Uh, that's, oh, hang on. And you can get big place cells uh, because you've got big grid cells. All right, well, so let's play um, a, a new trick. So now, let's say the Tom and Eichenbaum machine likes walking around walls or approaching uh, shiny objects, behaving much more like a rat would behave. These kinds of things uh, change the transition probabilities, and so they should change the optimal representations that Tem builds. <coughs> 
Okay, so uh, here are the, so, some, some types of cells that we see then. Uh, here's, here, are, here's a, here are two cells that always fire at a particular vector relationship from any object. Right, so this one on the left uh, fires um, three, four, three pixels north of any object, and this one on the right fires six pixels to the east of any object. <coughs> And so these are, and, and, and these things, if you move to a different world, uh, these things move with the objects, right? And these, this is what happens, uh, and the, uh, these, these cells can be recorded in the entorhinal cortex by the Mosers, and they're called object vector cells. And what these guys do in TEM is it factorizes the implication of objects from the structure of space. So you can learn to approach objects when they're over here, and then if you see a new object over here, you can immediately infer the transition structure without having to learn it again. So just one shot infer the transition structure. <coughs> so the next... Uh, uh, the next thing you see, because the, uh, the rats, the ten was wandering around walls, you start to see representations of those, uh, of those walls in the entorhinal cortex, just like uh, you do uh, in, uh, in, in real biology. Um, and, so, uh, uh, and, and so that's going to allow you to, to separate the implications of walls from the implications of 2D space. And so that's going to mean that you can start building uh, worlds uh, with uh, re representations of worlds uh, with, uh, with walls and doors in all sorts of different places. All right, so in general, I, that suggests to me that this zoo of cells that's often recorded in the, um, uh, in the uh, entorhinal cortex is, uh, is a basis set for representing transitions and then inferring them rapidly in new worlds. Okay, so let's move down to the hippocampus in this situation, and now we can start to see uh, exactly what we predict, right? Because the hippocampus is a conjunction between those, uh, those entorhinal cells and the sensory input, uh, you can start seeing things that looked like those object vector cells, but are a little bit different. So these landmark cells, they'll appear for some objects, but not others, depending on the sensory properties. And so you compare those to those object vector cells, which really just represent the transitions, the hippocampal cells uh, are, 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 um, are more selective to the objects they respond to, and that's exactly the same as what you see um, in the hippocampal um, uh, in hippocampal landmark cells. <coughs> okay, right. So we've 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 been arguing that somehow the structure of space generalizes across environments to form your hippocampal representation, but that seems a puzzle for anybody that's, that knows the hippocampal literature, because everyone that knows the hippocampal literature thinks that in two different worlds, the hippocampal representations are orthog orthogonal to each other. There, there's this thing called global remapping, where if, um, uh, if, if two place cells are next to each other in one world, there's nothing to say whether or not they're going to be next to each other in the other world. So it seems difficult to imagine how some structural knowledge can be transferred in the, in the uh, hippocampus between those two worlds. <coughs> but, um, uh, and so, uh, so, so let's, see, uh, let, let, let's see if that's true in TEM, where, so here in TEM, uh, and so here's an example of, uh, a re two, of two cells remapping both in um, uh, uh, real data on the right and in TEM on the left, and you can see in both cases we get this kind of remapping to, to some new place, but we know what's causing it in TEM. In TEM, what's causing it is those, um, uh, the structural cells are somehow periodic, and the, and the hippocampal cells are a conjunction with the next, with the sensory, with the sensory representation. And so there's nothing to say in that new world that the sensory representation would have been at the same peak of the grid cell uh, as, uh, as in the other cells. So it might look like a remapping, but it might actually be... Oh, I was going to just remind you this conjunction, which I've just done. It might actually be something a little bit more like this. And so here's an example of a real cell which is remapped, but it's remapped to a different peak of, that, of the same grid cell. And so if, that's the, so if TEM is right, if these cells are just conjunctions between sensory stuff and structural stuff, then we should be able to predict where, um, where hippocampal, stuff, hippocampal neurons will remap to in new environments at above chance rates. <coughs> 
So we would, so we would expect, because the, the place cell is going to remap to the same phase, we would expect uh, that, that on average, the grid cell firing, if I go and take the, uh, how much the grid cell fired at that first place cell peak in environment one, and then take how much that grid cell fired at the second uh, place cell peak at environment two, uh, then we'd see some correlation between them. Uh, and that's in fact true in two independent data sets, um, both from uh, UCL, one from Caswell Barry, one from Neil Burgess. Um, and so this shows a correlation between uh, the grid cell firing at a place cell peak in environment one and a, and a, and a grid cell firing between the uh, same grid cell uh, firing at that same place cell peak in environment two. And that correlation is pretty much exactly the same kind of correlation that we would predict uh, from just a sensory structural conjunct conjunction. So here's the model uh, plotted against the data. <coughs> okay, but the other thing that, uh, that remember, so all, all, much of the data I've showed you so far about TEM has been spatial. But remember, I started off by saying that we could represent arbitrary uh, graphs arbitrary structures or arbitrary graphs. And so we're interested in whether or not we can make representations in much more complex tasks where it's difficult to intuit what the representation should be. And so uh, here's, here's one recent example, just, as a, just to give you one example of this. Uh, this is, um, uh, this is a, 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 um, a study from Tonegawa Lab uh, where um, um, mouse or rat, I'm not too sure which, um, <laughs> was asked to run round a lap, f a loop, four times uh, to get a reward. And so, uh, um, and so it, it's, not, it's still a sort of spatial task, but on top of that, it's got some, uh, some cognitive component. It has to c count the laps uh, that it's doing to know whether it's going to get a reward or not. And so Tem says that to do the, to the hippocampus in this kind of task should have two types of representation. It still has to predict the sensory event that's going on right now, and so it still needs place cells. So here are some cells that just on every lap uh, respond in the same place. But also it needs a representation uh, that builds a latent state of, of, of where it is in what, in what lap. And so it should uh, make some cells that are lap, lap specific. In fact, it should have this, in fact, this TEM says that the representation of that lap uh, should have uh, two different types of cells in it as well. There should be some cells that are really uh, lap specific, and there should be some cells uh, that sort of build up to the reward, like, they, like they're counting, one, lap one, lap two, lap three. And if you go and look what the data shows, then you see something like that, right? You see some, a whole bunch of cells, uh, place cells, lap one, lap two, lap three, lap four. This is just one cell across repeats. Uh, some cells that are really lap specific, this one just fires on lap one. And then you see a bunch of cells that fire increasingly as you get towards the reward. So I think this kind of, I mean, one of the exciting things about you being able to use things like backprop, which does make things more confusing, is that you, maybe we can start to predict representations in an understandable way in these slightly more complicated uh, tasks. OK. So that's the end of uh, mice. <laughs> um, right. So uh, I've got 14 minutes left to tell you about humans. Um, actually, probably, yeah. Good. Uh, so we know we've, people might have, know, might have known that we've trained these kind of graph tasks in humans for a while. Um, and the basic finding, which is very reproducible now, is that the further away you are on a graph, so th th what I'm plotting is representational similarity between these guys measured later after they've just randomly diffused on this graph. They've seen them one after the other. And the further away they are on this graph, the further uh, the representational distance in the entorhinal cortex, often in medial frontal cortex, um, and, sometimes in, and sometimes in hippocampus. Anna, Shirero, Anna Shapiro has done uh, similar types of study. <clears throat> so if we want, w w the, the, this, uh, this talk is about abstraction, and so if we wanted to find out what those representations look like, then we might be able to play this, that, same tr that same remapping trick that you saw earlier. And so we want, are the, is it the case that these representations that we're looking at are abstracted from the sensory stimuli, or are they just the sort of Hebbian binding of the different sensory stimuli? And the way to find that out is to take two maps that have the same structure and see, well, do those two things, which are completely different, have never been seen together, so they learn those two maps completely separately, but, do, but does that representation look like that representation in the same way that you would uh, with grid cells? <coughs> 
And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, Mona, Mona Garvitz uh, found that out um, in this medial frontal region and, um, uh, and slightly below threshold in the entorhinal cortex. <laughs> um, but, but it's definitely in this medial frontal region. So it looks like these abstractions can happen uh, for these uh, graph-like structures. <coughs> Uh, and just to remind you that this medial frontal region is this region that appears to have grid-like cells in humans, but they, where they haven't been reported um, in, in rodents. Okay, and this is a, I'm just, uh, this is a, a question about whether, um, uh, uh, whether humans do behaviorally infer those links that you don't show them. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to uh, point you to this. I'm not going to explain it because Shirley has a poster here. And Shirley's going to tell you that if you pre-train people on different structures and then remap to new graphs, they can guess uh, the, the links that you don't show them, just like Tem uh, was doing. <coughs> okay, so uh, the last uh, section of my talk is about replay. And um, I, I think it sits on its own, but I also think it, sit, it potentially sits within the framework of, of this uh, Tom and Alkama machine that I've been describing. I'm going to try to sell it to you in that framework, but if you don't buy it in that framework, still try and buy it for the data itself. <laughs> um, <coughs> all right. <coughs> so the question is this, right? So remember, in... <coughs> in um, uh, so, so in order to learn these representations, I had to predict sensory input because I couldn't train the abstract representations off each other. So I needed a generative model of the world. And so we built this generative model, which, looked, uh, which, which had these things a bit like the hippocampus. And this generative model can imagine self-consistent trajectories. Right? So it can imagine trajectories that form loops and, and, fill, and, and, and put the right thing in the right place. Well, we know something about something else that can imagine trajectories. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, so this is um, hippocampal uh, replay. So here are these, uh, here are these, um, uh, uh, the, the, the place fields of a bunch of place cells. And if you, uh, so this is what was happening when they, w when they were running down the track. But later, when the, when the um, mouse or rat was, is sleeping, uh, you can record in the local field potentials uh, these rapid oscillations, which are called sharp wave ripples, and during that time, uh, these place fields play out again, and they play out in the correct order. And in fact, there's a whole lot of data showing out that they'll play out in the correct order, even the <coughs> the, 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 they'll play out in the correct order even for um, things that haven't been experienced. Okay, so <coughs> it's been suggested for a long time, even before these replay events were measured, uh, that by Jeff Hinton and Peter Dayan, that something like this would be needed to train uh, is a generative model that would be needed to train up, um, that would train up uh, 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 like the Helmholtz machine or variational autoencoders. And recently, it's become a big theme in replay uh, in the replay world that these might be generative models. So the question that we have then is, well, let's just. Assume everyone's right, and these guys are, are part of a generative model. Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but let's assume they are. It definitely involves these guys. Does it also involve these guys, these, uh, these abstract representations playing along? And if it does, can it use these abstractions to make rapid inferences? And so bear with me, we're going to do this in humans. Um, it might seem odd to measure replay in humans, uh, but you'll see why later. And in order to, ex to show you this data, I need to just quickly tell you how we can measure replay in humans. So what we do is we put humans in an MEG scanner, and we show them a bunch of pictures. And we figure out the MEG sensor pattern, what it looks like uh, for each picture. <coughs> then we, put those sequ those, we, we teach those subjects an ordering of those, uh, of those stimuli. And then we uh, let them rest, and then we do some task that uses that sequence. And the question is this. During this rest period here, do these, do these original sensor patterns reactivate? And if so, in what order? And the answer is yes. You can tell yes from this. Uh, you can tell various things from this graph. I'll just show you how to read it. This graph tells you uh, yes, and the answer is it plays forwards. Uh, the reason it's yes, it plays A, B, C, D, is because this, um, this line here is above this multiple comparison corrected permutation test, which is here. 
<coughs> and you can see that if we trace from control order, nowhere on this line gets above this multiple comparison permutation test. And you can see that this replay is really quick. Um, uh, so here, because the, the place it gets above this line is here at about 40 to 50 milliseconds. So in this rest period, the subject's sensor representations, the subject's brain is going ABCD, 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 like that. <coughs> and we can also find all those A's at the starts of all those ABCDs, and we can then uh, align uh, the, the, power, uh, the power spectrum to the, to the starts of those A's. And if we do that, we see something that looks like this, uh, which is a big power deposition in exactly the frequency range of those sharp wave ripples that they recorded in the hippocampus. So it looks like you can measure uh, replay in humans uh, in, a w in a way that's a, that, that looks like the, those replay events that we can measure in mice or rats. OK, that was my little aside. Uh, back to this abstraction question. And the question is this. Did our replay look like this, A, B, C, D? Or did it look like, like more like this? Abstract one, two, three, four. OK, one was A, two was B, three was, a, was this. A little bit like this system that I was showing you uh, before. And if it looks like this, then, uh, so here are these abstract representations. If it looked like this, can it infer, infer new sequences even if it's never actually seen these transitions uh, from some rule? So these are so in, with some different pictures. OK, so in order to do that, we, do that, we did a second experiment, where we, um, uh, which was a little bit more complicated for the subjects to learn. So in this experiment, <coughs> um, subjects came in, and they were told two sequences. So this is the day before. They came in, and they were told two sequences. But those sequences weren't the sequences we wanted them to learn, rather confusingly. Instead, there were these other two sequences that we wanted to learn. And what they learned was the mapping between the sequences we told them and the sequences that they actually needed to, to do the task. And so they'd learn something like that. Move number one, one to number two, four. And we actually told them that. And they had loads of experiences of doing it. And they could learn that. Because the next day, we were going to get them to use the same mapping, the same rule, but with a whole bunch of different uh, uh, stimuli, which meant they would never actually have seen the, trans the true transitions between those new stimuli. Right? And so we're trying to get them to, to infer a replay rather than build a replay. <coughs> OK, uh, that's why I used humans. <laughs> um, OK, so, um, uh, so, so w did replay infer that new order? And so the, question, the answer is yes. So this, was, this, is the, um, this is the new stimuli, and this is a replay for the order that they experienced. And this is the replay for the order that they had to infer uh, with the rule, right? And so you can see that you get this same 40 to 50 millisecond replay, but for this inferred uh, sequence. OK, so how did they do that? Did they use an abstraction, like the abstraction that I was talking about before? And, uh, the, uh, and so, uh, so what we're going to try and look for is representations of this 1, 2, 3, 4. So, so far, we've seen representations replaying of these visual stimuli, but what if we could find representations of these one, two, three, four? And we can, because we've got two different um, stimuli, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, we've got two different sequences, and so we can do things like decoding position or decoding sequence rather than just decoding the stimulus, right? And so we play that game, and so the question is, uh, what, what representations can we see? But this, the, this is now at the time when they saw the sequence in the wrong order. The wrong, this, is the, this is when we're teaching them the sequence in the wrong order. I'm just going to show you what the representation looks like. It looks like this is sensory sequence. Uh, so this is feet. So that's a sensory representation only. So that can, that can, this representation can predict whenever it's going to see feet. This, and then it says, well, put it in sequence one. So this representation is common across all elements that are going to end up in sequence one, in the, in the final sequence one. Not the sequence one we showed them, but the inferred sequence one. And this representation says, put it at position two. Right, so this representation, uh, uh, two minutes, okay, fine. This representation is common across both of the things that were in position two, even though they're different stimuli. Okay, and so, um, 
Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's common across both these representations of two. OK, so does this abstract code also replay during rest? And I'm going to show you that uh, by, uh, by plotting the time lag between the stimulus and its, and its position. So I'm going to say, well, if I saw a foot, did I see a position two b b before it? And the answer is yes, I did. I saw a position two about 40 milliseconds before it. And that's also true for the sequence code. I saw the correct sequence code, but not the incorrect sequence code, about 40 milliseconds before each, each uh, stim. And so that means, uh, that means that replay events at the whole brain level don't just look like um, sensory stuff. They look like this rich representation. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, a depiction of a replay event where you've got an abstract representation of one, two, three, four, tied and 40 milliseconds later, the correct stimuli appear after those things. A little bit like this machine here. Uh, OK. Um, uh, and I, uh, uh, this is the last thing I'm going to say. Uh, so we actually gave them some rest before we showed them the new stimuli. And, um, and we wanted to do that because that position code, that one, two, three, four, is, doesn't rely on them seeing the stimuli. Right? That's just like a structural thing and can be going along happily by itself before it sees the new stimuli. And it did. It, it did. And it was going backwards. And I don't know why, but, um, uh, but um, uh, uh, I can talk about that later. There's plenty of evidence for forwards and backwards replay in the rodents, too. But anyway, this is a little bit like what Tonegawa calls preplay, uh, where, where, um, where, where place codes will play out before you've ever experienced those, those playouts. And, and maybe that kind of thing is what allows these inferences to happen. <laughs> OK, so uh, maybe I'm exactly on time with my Eric. So I wanted to tell you today that uh, relational reasoning and space are very similar, or the same thing. Maybe that's a bit over the top. <laughs> relational structure is abstracted and represented explicitly. Enterhinal cells are a, transition, are a basis set for transition structure, so you can do quick inferences. Hippocampal remapping isn't random, um, and then um, replay can spontaneously reorganize experience. Thanks very much indeed. Microphones, if you can raise your hand, someone is going to come up to you. I've got some thanks. Um, hey. And so, starting there. And if the uh, next two speakers can please come forward and get ready um, so that we can try to keep things mostly on time. Hi. Well, thanks very much for the talk. I wanted to ask you, um, so the first part was mostly about a relation of reasoning. So either spatial or abstract, if you want, relations that basically could be seen as commutative in a sense. So I have a sister. My sister has a brother in a sense, right? Um, actually, you just need, I think, I think for, the, for this, so I think for this exact system to work, you don't need any commutative. You, all you need is lo loops in the relation, potential loops in the relationships. That's what you need. It needs to be able to somehow get back to the same place. There are ways we think of relaxing that requirement, but currently the system we have requires loops in the relational graph. Okay, so that probably goes into yeah the question I was trying to ask you. Yeah, let's see if it still makes sense. So if you had some temporal relationships, some asymmetrical temporal relationships, so for example, you see some, I don't know, shattered pieces of something on the ground. Can you tell me whether it was a mug, a plate, a teapot, or something else? Maybe some of them are missing. I think that conceptually we can, but in practice we can't yet. Let's answer that question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing we're trying to think about, but this system by itself right now won't do that. Yeah. Yeah, hey, thanks for the talk. So um, if I understand it correctly, your story was, um, as an example then, for one kind of structural relationship thing, for one graph. Um, but usually you would imagine you have um, yeah, quite a lot of such graphs holding quite different type of relationships. Um, can, you can you infer which graph you're in right now? Uh, right, so you will need to infer which relational structure you're in and then infer all the relationships what? you hold and so on. So how would it scale? What is your idea about this, um, if you have all of that? So uh, uh. We've, we've, it, it's not quite true that it's just one graph, right? It's one 
So, and, and there were so it's definitely not one graph. So, so it's not one graph, but one, one structural form. Yeah, form. One form. Right, many it, structural forms. Form. Yeah. So. So, it's, so currently it works for one structural form, with the sort of exception, actually, of object vector cells, which are like compositional, right? So they are composing structural forms out of a mixture of 2D graphs and a, an attractor basin, right? That's what object vectors are doing. They're saying, okay, take my 2D graph, I can put an attractor basin on top of it, right? And so that, so, and, and it can put the attractor basin anywhere it wants. So that's like composing, and I think that in general, we will be able to do, com we'll, we'll be able to do compositions in this system. I, I don't know how easily, or how, and that's what we'll, we're gonna try and do that next. Lots of compositions of it. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, exactly. Hi, hi, Tim. Beautiful work. Hi, Dan. Um, let me apologize in, in, in advance for my naivete, because I don't know that much about uh, the spatial system in entorhinal cortex and hippocampus of rodents. But um, I'm vaguely familiar with some of Lisa DiGiacomo's recent work. And there are two things that jump out that I thought I was understanding from her work about entorhinal cortex. One is, is that cells are characterized most prominently by mixed selectivity rather than these kinds of pure selectivity cells that you were talking about. And the second is, is that it's not actually a rigid map, that it actually restructures depending upon behaviorally relevant uh, you know, stimuli and goal seeking. And that the, so that the whole map within the entorhinal cortex is actually dynamic. And if, if both those things are true, I'm wondering how that affects how you're thinking about the information transfer from entorhinal cortex into the, hippocamp into the hippocampus to generate what you're calling these conjunctive representations, given that the entorhinal cortex may not be such a simple representation. So that, um, uh, that result from Lisa is lovely, and uh, the one from Joe Chichvari is lovely to go with it, uh, showing that the grids bend, uh, can bend. I think that's really entirely almost what we're saying. Right? We're saying the grids are, the, are a way of inferring transition structures, and in their case, the in, in their case the transition structures. Um, uh, so in, in their case, uh, the, the, the grids bent to attract you to a reward, um, and so uh, and I think ours will as well if that reward's always in the same uh, kind of location as theirs were. In fact, James can predict Lisa's data here, um, and so w the question is, what should you do if you want to change your your transition functions? If you want to do it really, really flexibly so you can rapidly change them anywhere you want, then you need object vector cells. If you just want to bend them so, that you, so you always warp into the same part of space, then you can just bend the grid cells. You don't have to factorize it away. And TEM does exactly that. So TEM will uh, absolutely re um, uh, do those kinds of things. Uh, the question of mixed selectivity. Uh, so, uh, I mean, when we... Uh, so uh, it, it, we have done these very precise training and the training that we did was done because we thought that would make um, these lovely cells that would impress Moza and that kind of stuff. But if we just let the rat run around and experience its behavior, I suspect we would not be getting really beautiful factorized representations, right? I suspect that we'd be getting a mixture of those and mixed selectivity. And, and that those would be, so I mean, I basically, yeah, I basically think that Lisa and us conceptually think the same thing, which is those grids aren't like little machines that are trying to control you towards objects. They're just a representation of the transition structure. That's what they are. Yeah, exactly. Hi, Tim. Hi, Mate. Beautiful work. Um, I was wondering, so if I understood you correctly, the trans these relational structures that you were looking at were embedded in 2D space. And I was wondering what happens if you embed them in 3D, uh, in particular given you know, results from BATS by Nahum Ulanovsky, where he shows that actually in 3D, these beautiful regular lattices that we see in 2D tend to break down. Are you talking about stretchy birds? Are you talking about the empirical data? Or are you talking about yeah. the empirical data, or are you talking about the, the modeling? In light of the empirical data from bats in yeah. about 3D grid cells, which are not as regular. Ah, you're saying what would what happen exactly? What happens in the model if we yes. if we put it in 3D? That's my I don't question. know. Good question, James. What happens in the model if we put it in 3D? <laughs> okay, we don't know. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thanks. For, oh, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant talk. Thanks so much. Uh, I wonder when you generalize to new spaces. Uh, is it always the complexity or the number of items, for example, of those new spaces the same? Or no. So what, 
So you might have an increase in Bigger, load. Bigger, smaller, more yeah. sensory stimuli, okay, less great. sensory stimuli. So that, that uh, takes me to the next uh, small question, which is, did you see any relation between the dynamical properties of these MEG patterns or replay patterns oh. uh, with the, uh, the complexity of these new spaces that the, the humans have to generalize knowledge? Like, there are recent results by the Buzaki lab oh, where they show that, you know, uh, subway ripples, they change their duration, they get longer, if the rat, when oh, they had that, to generalize oh, knowledge, the, the so, world was more complex. So, I don't, so that definitely wouldn't happen in the model. Mm -hmm. Fun things okay. to add, maybe. Uh, and I don't know in the humans, because all in the humans, everything was the same length. So I can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. I slightly suspect we would not know, even if we had done it in different lengths, unless we'd set it up as a direct test. Because unlike, unlike it's always the same with human work versus rodent work. Unlike in rodents where you can see every replay perfectly as the, in humans you have to average a lot of data to start seeing those replay stuff. So, so yeah. it wouldn't be technically possible you, you It would be possible if you set out with that hypothesis mm -hmm. and, out and made a whole bunch of data which you expected to see narrow re replays and a whole bunch of data where you expected. But what wouldn't be possible, as always in humans, unlike in rats, what wouldn't be possible is just to go and look in your data and just see if there's anything interesting there. <laughs> like that, does, that doesn't happen in human research. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so let's thank Tim again. Cool.